Hey out there Akronites, welcome once again to Around Akron with Blue Green. Now this episode has a whole lot of heart. We're going to meet up with Narali and talk all about her love of henna artwork and henna tattoos and she teaches a class in Bollywood dancing. What a combination. I'm going to head down to the Akron Blind Center and hang out with my new family. We're going to head down to Canton and visit a National Historic Site. Now to kick this show off today, I'm going to meet up with the Akron Aviators. That's right, Akron has its very own semi-professional basketball team. Let's go see what this team is all about. A lot of my background is in the entertainment industry. Uh, I run a company called Royal Air Entertainment. And, you know, international media, marketing, distribution, mostly music business. And I co-host an entertainment conference call every other Tuesday with my mentor named Kermit Henderson. And Kermit has over 200 gold and platinum records, over 200 number one billboard hits. He's got a diamond billboard number one ring from Janet Jackson that they don't even make anymore, like quadruple OG. This guy's been in the game a long time. And he's taken me under his wing, and that's where a lot of my accolades from working with him um, just briefly, I've been involved with 12 number one billboard hits, um, two digital radio tracker plaques, and a quadruple platinum plaque from that. And every other Tuesday night, we co-host a music business conference call to give back to artists. It's a way to, I'll do interviews, and we've had artists like Jeezy, Tyrese, Layla Hathaway, and feature independent artists as well. And it's open for anyone to call and ask questions. And it's interesting because you never know who's listening. A man named Harold Whaley from the ABA was listening, who had music industry experience. And one of his points was to artists, don't forget about minor league baseball. They need national anthem singers, uh, arena football teams, minor league basketball. There are performance opportunities outside the traditional realm of just on stage at a concert. So that made me reach out afterwards and, you know, hey, uh, I like the interview um, and then the notes that you gave during, you know, this call and it was really cool. And a little while later, I reached out to the ABA and found a, a guy named uh, Antoine Washington, who was the head of their media entertainment division He's from Pittsburgh. We had a lot of mutual friends in common in the industry and on the spot kind of formed a partnership for entertainment for the ABA. So we would be doing after game parties, helping book talent during the games. And I did that for about a year. And at the time there were no teams in Ohio. Like at one point there was one in Dayton recently, but you know, I guess they, I don't know if they folded or were taking time off, but there was just this, an opening here. reached out and said, uh, if you're interested in a team, we like the work you guys were doing, let us know. We're going to open it back up to the public tomorrow. And if I'd let someone else start a team in Akron, it would have just like destroyed me. Whether they'd succeeded or failed, because if it had failed, I, w I wouldn't have done it that way. Why? <laughs> uh, but if it had worked out, it would have been like, dang, I knew that would have worked. Why didn't I do it? So I signed the paperwork in May of 2017, um, the next week I left the country for something with music and I made an announcement in Paris online that I'm starting this team here in Akron and we held tryouts in July and here we are. It was actually here at uh, Balch, we had our first tryouts, we were right here. I wanted the team in Akron um, when we originally started the team, they wanted to put it somewhere else where there was a vacancy. Well, I don't want to be an owner from a distance because if something dumb happens, I need to be there to help out and fix it. As far as the next level, there wasn't anything here. And I'm a fan of like alliteration, so I had kind of went through like, what is Akron known for? You know, it's the birthplace of aviation, the airport's right there. So flight, flying, Akron aviators that just, kind of came to mind. I was really appreciative of, of the 
response that we've been getting from just the community and it's great to be able to provide an opportunity to the players. So many guys before we were here, you know, we'd even see in this gym training to go to a tryout in Kentucky <clears throat> or they want to go play on a team in Michigan or somewhere else and nothing against those teams but <clears throat> because there were no options here. There was nothing in Youngstown or, or Akron or you know, so they felt that they needed to go. And there's so much talent here. And we're just proud of our guys. We've had seven players in our two and a half seasons so far who were either drafted to other leagues or international or invited to training camps. Not only is this a launch pad for, for you know, that next level, whatever you want it to be, it's also a great home for players. Maybe you have a good job and you enjoy it but you're still in great shape and you want to compete still. Like you, you still want to play the game on a high level. That's who you build the franchise around. Those are your faces. That's the face of your franchise. Those are the hometown heroes and you have to have that. Like that's mandatory um, to succeed. You have to have some kind of recognizable face. Um, and then the last accolade, uh, our point guard who's been with us all three seasons, Malik Billingsley, is the reigning ABA three-point champion and skills challenge champion during All-Star Weekend. So, a lot of opportunities here. Next up, we're gonna meet up with my friend, Nirali. Now, she teaches a Bollywood dancing class. Now, if that's not fun enough, she also does henna tattoos and henna artwork. Let's go see what her amazing abilities are all about. Henna is a natural plant dye, I mix my own with essential oils, lemon water, sugar, and all wonderful stuff. It started using, it's a f more than 5,000 years old technique. And I, it's not just the new, it's a medicine for many, many people. So for henna, when I was a child, I still remember my mom, whenever I get the fever, my mom puts tons of henna on me, like on my feet, because henna, I didn't realize it as a natural cooling agent. So it helps your body to cool down. People do use the chemical henna, which is not safe for the skin. It has a chemical dye. It's the dye is more like a gasoline product. Canada already banned on those kind of chemical cone. The way that you're supposed to know whether it's the regular henna that somebody made this paste. Natural henna has only two days shelf life. So if I kept my henna cone out in a normal temperature, I can't use it. I have to freeze my henna every time and I can only use a couple of times. It never give you instant color. It's always from orange to brown. If it is give you instant color, no, it's not safe. So you always ask your henna artist, do you make your henna paste? And they said, yes, you can always ask, what do you put? And they should tell you what they exactly, how they made it. So I use tea tree oil, eucalyptus oil, lavender oil. That's what I use. So I never afraid to tell anybody because if you are like allergic to any essential oils, you shouldn't have it. I use body biodegradable glitter, which is safer for the skin. So all I do just sprinkle it like a fairy dust. And then I took Take my air blower and ta-da! <laughs> That's what it looks like. I really like that I'm bringing my culture, being like authentic dance. I'm not just somebody who learned a few years ago and doing it. I'm like I born in India, I know since dancing since I was four years old, so I'm like bringing all these skills, authenticity, which people here really appreciate, especially people who come to the yoga, who really appreciate that I'm bringing 
in they probably at one point of their life they all watched that bollywood movie and they always wonder like oh my god i get so many responses on my facebook that hey that's wonderful that you are teaching this body thank you for bringing even my own like a people the indian people they send me thank you notes they said thank you for teaching this bollywood dance because who can bring that culture you know you have to in america is such a wide there's so many different culture people you have to every culture does a different thing so why not i i was thinking this why not i can bring something to the people like you know there's something new it's not that hard <laughs> Bollywood is a very specific related to movie dance but remember there are different classical music like a classical dance like a bharatanatyam which i learned it there is kathak there is a belly dancing there is a different like there's tons of dancing so you have to make sure like which one you are doing it so if i wanted to people say hey can we do the classical dance i could but it has to be a bharatanatyam you know So there are different kind of dancing when people said oh what's a bollywood it said bollywood it's more like a musical for you so it's a song they be and i always bring the dancing all the steps that actually in actual movie so i try to imitate the same exact steps so i learn those steps at home do a lot of practice and come here and show you guys so I really wish people would come join me with this Bollywood dance class. I remember when I was a child I go to the temples and many time in temple I seen the mandala arts and it's very common having a mandala art in a temple and as a child I whenever I seen I always fascinated by those art and i always say you know, why that looks so good and it has my like the image was in my brain so i think so it's very symbolism for me whenever i do and of course whenever i do this one i always bring it's a good vibe energy from me i personally the mandala art remember it's a one circle it's a circle that's like you know you have to believe in a circle like our life is a circle it's everything goes around come back around so it, the energy is never going to waste it's it's always recycle it so think like that it's a good energy i put it actually in my temple right now so i put the buddha in front of it so my buddha is very plain and then it's feel like it's going to give a little vibes to that and it looks amazing that way so i personally i put literally my like all my heart in this my art so every time whenever i do it it's like i'm giving my part of my heart to somebody next up i'm going to head down to the akram blind center and hang out with my new family that's right my new family it's an amazing location and a lot of us have sight take it for granted and we don't realize how difficult life can be not being able to see let's go see what the akram blind center is all about i see the beauty in you I don't look at the ugliness of the personality. I look at the heart of what you can do. That's what it means to me. But being visual impaired cuz I don't say being blind because there's someone that can see. It's blind with the surrounding that of the surrounding. that they have and they blind to that for those who do not know about the Akron Blind Center that that need love need to know how to accept their blindness be able to accept who they are and be able to have the independence that they need to be visual impaired this is not planned there are some of us that was born with this the never seen colors 
never seen what a person looked like or even know about their shapes and sizes. So our mission is to give opportunities to people, uh, which otherwise they might not have. And again, give them an opportunity to come here and have a sense of achievement and accomplishment to be with others of like challenges, and that's critical for them. Uh, you can imagine feeling like you're on a raft in the middle of the ocean and no one can understand what you're truly going through. When you're around other people who really get it, that puts everything in perspective and helps you out. When you first lose your sight, one thing that happens is you go through stages of loss, shock, anger, denial, depression, negotiation, and then you come to the acceptance phase. Well, we have people who have been blind for 40, 50 years and still are not at that phase, but they can come here and have a sense of belonging. This is their community, and that's what makes it so effective and beneficial for them. Akron Blind Center is a, it's a, it, I feel like I have a, a true purpose helping other visually challenged individuals. At every day that I walk in these doors and if I've helped one person in that day, I've accomplished a day's work. I feel like I am an asset to this place. I feel like I am a very valued and meaningful person and we're part of a, we're part of a team here. And it's so, I mean, just to, to say how much it, I just like the ability to serve and the ability to help others. That's what serving the Akron Blind Center is, is all about to me. This is my home. This is my place. This is my place of work. This is my place to, to enjoy and to, to, to cherish. And I, I plan to be here indefinitely. We have a sign out in our entryway that says, Welcome Home to the Akron Blind Center. And this truly is, for a lot of people, this is truly their reason for living and, and going about their life is to be here with others who we truly care about. Uh, you know, when someone, one of our members is in the hospital, we'll go visit them. Uh, you're not a client here. You are not just a member, you're part of our family. Uh, and we truly embrace you and bring you in uh, and make you feel comfortable and warm in being here. You form a close bond in, in being in this environment and we really do care of each other. We, we really love each other, we hug each other and everything else that we do together, we're a, a team facing everything else out there together. And we have a motto here at the Akron Blind Center, which is we can and we will. It's a very positive, uplifting, uh, it, it shows what we can do as it, when you lose your sight, that you are not completely out of commission, that there are opportunities for you again to give back and to be with others and to go about your lives and to figure out different ways to do things. We don't consider ourselves to be disabled, we're differently abled. We're not handicapped, we're handy capable. <music> the only one that, lo that loves and, 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 and would be lost without this place. I mean, uh, if you, you know, th this is our home. This is our, our world. You know, we, I come here every day and I feel like, you know, I've been blessed. There are days that are harder than others in, in, in anything. I go home and I'm, I'm mentally spent, but I, I make this, we make this happen every day. There's, there's, a, there's a magic in this place that doesn't exist anywhere else in the entire world. We will, we will. Next up, I'm gonna head down to Canton. That's right, it's called Around Akron with Blue Green, but Canton is Around Akron. Now I'm gonna meet up with the First Lady's National Historic Site. This place is full of history, full of just an amazing story. Let's go see what this place is all about. Ida was part of the Saxton family that was a super prominent family here in Canton. 
I mean, she was pretty impressive for herself at a young age. She was very well educated. She went to school at a lot of the time where women her age were just not educated. She has the equivalent of like a master's of fine arts in our terms. And she also was working as a 20 year old, which is not something that 20 something year old women would do in the 1800s. So even before becoming first lady, she was impressive in her own right. It was always her family's house. So even though they lived here, William McKinley never owned it. And it was really a lot of tragedy in their life that brought them back here. So they had two children, but both of their children died in childhood. So it was after the first death of their second child that they moved back into the space from another house they lived at briefly. And from what I understand is that Ida just wanted to be closer to her family. So after the death of someone, she wanted to come home where her sister was living with all of her children. And so that's when they moved into the third floor and made it kind of like their apartment with their own bedroom and their own space up there. And so this was always their home base. Even when he was living in Washington, they would always come back here. And when they talk to each other and they refer to home, they're referring to this building we're in now. This building we're in right now is what we call the Saxton home. So it is the ancestral home of Ida Saxton McKinley. So in here, you're in like the main experience of our site. Coming here, if you're gonna do one thing, you definitely wanna take the tour of this house. Cause you go through history from like the 1840s to the 1870s and even past that as there are adults and living in this house. So you get to see where she grew up. And then going upstairs, you get to see where William McKinley was in his office and that close proximity they had to each other that really tells the story of their life together. The office on the third floor and that third floor space total was the McKinley. So Ida and William, and for a brief time, their daughter Katie lived there as well. So that is the only space left because their other house, which they called the campaign house, was demolished. His original birth home is not there anymore in Niles. So this space is the only original space you can walk into and be in the same space that they actually lived in was their private quarters. His residency ends with him being assassinated, so he doesn't get to come back here. She comes back to Canton, and she actually returns to the campaign house and lives there. I mean, as you can imagine, coming back to this house where her sister, all her sister's kids, her sister's husband have all survived would be pretty painful for her to come back and have lost her husband and her two children. The initial build on this house was in the 1840s, and those would have been Ida's grandparents. So they built a, a structure that's probably half the size of what you see now. And then when her mother inherits the house, they almost double the size of this house. So that would have been in the 1870s. And they add on a lot of additions that are like for, more formal than what was in the original structure. Like you have the formal parlor, they add on the ballroom on the third floor. So they're really expanding the house to make it more reflective of their status in society. So when you walk in now, you see stuff like the grand staircase and that welcoming area, and that shows you how like prominent they were in Canton at the time. So it went from her grandparents that had the initial 1840s to her parents who add on. And then the house goes down to their children. So Mary is the, really the one controlling the house at that point. And that's what it kind of is made to look like now, like Mary is an adult living here. And then the house goes down to Mary's children. And at that point is when they sell the house. So the house is sold because it's a huge house, but it doesn't have the amenities that are starting to come into fashion at the time. Like if you don't have running water and electricity in your house, it's probably not as appealing as one that does. And then it starts turning into a lot of different things like that commercial space that causes the first floor to be completely gutted. And then that you saw that terrible picture before of like the front thing they put on it in the 70s. And that's how we got to there until it was saved in recent years. Since the house went through all those phases, including the spot where it was commercial property, we don't have a lot of original stuff that was just left here, but what we, we do have is a lot of evidence on what the kinds of things the family liked, what, like what brands of wallpaper they liked, 
And in some cases we have pictures where we can see exactly what kind of built-ins were built into like this desk over here into the wall. And then we have things that continually come down through family members who are suddenly realizing they had something for a long time that belonged to you know, their great Aunt Ida or they knew something that belonged to William McKinley and then slowly stuff starts to come back into the house. So over the years I can imagine that we're just going to get more and more original stuff in the house. important because it tells the story of a first lady, Ida McKinley, and those are not the stories that we get to hear all the time, but I think they're the most relatable ones. So when you step through here and you hear her story, you get to see a part of history that's often ignored, and we can connect her story to other first ladies and what they've done, and in that way we're bringing up things from history that are kind of get, you know, tossed under the rug or forgotten over time. And a lot of these women did pretty significant things for us. Thank you once again for watching this episode of Around Akron with Blue Green. Now, if you have any questions, comments, or just want to drop me an email, you can reach me at www.aroundakronwithbluegreen.com or you can find me on Instagram or on Facebook. Thank you and have an amazing day. That's right, it's called Around Akron with Blue Green and yeah. Take two. <laughs>